All right, we're probably just go ahead and jump in. So, my name is Adam Arnold. I'm a you know, UI developer at Northwestern University Libraries. Um, I work on uh, at some of Northwestern, um, also at Long Island, media system UI developer. So, kind of hit my screen so our computers can help the guys on that. Yeah. Can you use the microphone? Yeah. Sorry. Hello. That sounded like a good one. Did it? Yeah. Is that coming through? It's just really quiet. Like, is there a little app up there? Hello. Is that yeah. it? Yeah. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, today I'm just going to kind of I think just give a hopefully just higher level overview of um, JavaScript UI components and uh, JavaScript frameworks and try to keep this as uh, non technical as possible and just kind of maybe a cloaked sales pitch for why we should be using more JavaScript and Sandberg applications. So um, there's you know definitely a lot happening in front end JavaScript development and tooling these days. Um, and again, the goal of this presentation is just to kind of look at part of this spectrum and kind of focus on components, some popular JavaScript frameworks and component libraries. Uh, components are either the source, like byproduct, or an architecture pattern for like many of the terms and tools in this graphic. And I'll try to shed some light on uh, some of the following. What is a JavaScript component? What does it look like? How do you make one? What are some JavaScript UI frameworks? React, Angular, Ember, Vue. What do these things do? Um, what's a component library? And why does it seem everyone is either using one or creating one these days? And what are some current web app architecture trends on the front end? And then finally, kind of interject how my Samara applications benefit from using JavaScript components. So to start off with, what is a JavaScript or UI component? Um, what is on the front end are simply just logical pieces of UI. So typical user interfaces are divided into many parts. Um, this example, there's like a root level component, which could be the overall layout of the page. There's a general navigation component, which contains a top level navigation component, primary navigation component, breadcrumbs, and so forth. Um, there's an image slider, there's a button. So basically everything you see in the UI here is a component. Uh, components are nested, big components. Um, typically are broken down into smaller subcomponents, which are continually broken down into smaller subcomponents, and uh, on and on until you arrive at the smallest single piece in component architecture. I think once you start seeing um, like web applications this way, you might not even see like websites anymore, but essentially just collections of UI components. And these kind of the heart of it are what the building blocks of modern UI applications are. So what does a component look like? Well, um, I guess the most unglamorous way to kind of look at a component at its core, um, this is what it looks like in the code. And for a developer, you know, it's a great way to kind of compress loaded redundant HTML into encapsulated presentation markup. Um, which means it's just a lot less code to display UI element to the screen. And this is not unlike you know, frameworks like Rails or PHP on the server side, but the difference in UI components is that you can bundle in application logic with this kind of abstracted presentation markup. Components also look like functions because they, um, at, at their core, they, they are functions. They take input, they return output in a consistent and reliable manner. So in this case, um, let's say we have a component called the card, example card. 
um, shows Matthew, his image, some cool hair, and some you know some metadata about Matthew. And if you look at the code on the right, it's larger. Um, you see the component is just a ES6 JavaScript function, but it returns an image. It returns some nicely formatted text, some HTML markup of some sort. You know, it's laid out nicely. So how is that possible from function? It's because UI components, again, are like a blending of functionality and presentation. So they basically combine HTML and JavaScript, and they return this um, thing called a UI component. Components look the same but different, so they're reusable. Um, for this component, you know, we can pass in a person object. It could be Matthew, it could be Ozzy, or whoever. And the component basically is going to dynamically display the data that we feed into it. This is kind of a key concept, I think, in understanding like the value in dynamic UI components. Um, we define the component once, so here, card example card, um, it's in one file, defined one place. And then we can use instances of this defined component um, tens or hundreds of times in our application without taking much of any performance hit or having to rewrite you know, surrounding presentation markup for each and every um, time we use it in our application. So the component is always going to basically look the same in structure. It will just contain different data. It's kind of takeaway that components are reusable, um, less code, more flexibility. So the easiest way to you know create UI components um, is to leverage an existing JavaScript framework. So in your front-end application, you'd include you know any library or framework package of your choice, either as part of the build process or you know explicitly as an include, and then you start writing framework components, which eventually will get compiled down to raw JavaScript, um, typically ES5 for cross-platform display. So as of 2018 and still like heading into 2019, um, this might be terms to be more like heard of for some of the more popular frameworks. We basically have React, um, Angular, and Vue. Um, this year for you know, Ember seems to be Kind of rocketing uh, for the past few months, but basically they all kind of do the same thing. They bind data to the UI and they speed up development of front end applications. And if we just look, you know, to the bottom of these growth numbers, like the overall trend is pretty significant and obvious, you know, where I think modern day web application development is at. Like now and where it's going. So these framework downloads, you know, they're doubling, tripling each year, and all these downloads are basically pumping out, you know, faster, more UI aware, single page applications. And people are just coming to expect, you know, their UIs to be fast, reactive, and it can definitely, you know, make or break products and applications. Uh, Try to keep this as generic as possible. And throughout this, if anyone has any questions, feel free to interrupt and try to clarify if I can. Um, so the largest player in the game is definitely React. It's the largest ecosystem of not only developers, but like libraries and um, all different you know, ways to develop React application. It's a library more than a framework, which means that it gives you the tools, but it doesn't necessarily tell you how that it should be implemented in your application. It has um, high rendering performance, so it uses this technology called virtual DOM to basically do diff checking to keep the UI updated. It's really fast. Um, most of the code is written in you know just native ES six or seven JavaScript, so it's typically it's more familiar to uh, JavaScript developers coming straight into it. Sometimes it's described as democratic chaos because it is a library, it gives you all the tools, but um, out of that, you know, you could either put your application together in a logical way, you know, something that makes sense, or you could very easily, you know, use it the wrong way too, which happens, it's all a learning. Um, and it's backed by Facebook. So Angular is more a framework than a library. Um, it 
it's definitely more opinionated on how it wants to be used within your application. You have less flexibility of how you implement it. Angular is definitely more popular, I think, at the enterprise level for like large scale corporate applications that at scale um, I, at varying degrees uh, as a steeper learning curve, partly because it uses TypeScript instead of JavaScript. So it's one more hurdle, I guess, for newcomers to, to jump in. Um, compared to your React, you know, it's described more as a dictatorship because, again, it's very opinionated on how it wants to be used with your application, and it's backed by Google. Vue.js is uh, definitely seeing the highest growth numbers in 2018. It's been described as the best of both worlds by some uh, React and Angular. It's, uh, and I think Vue might be a representation of where some of these frameworks are maybe going in the future as they continue to evolve. Uh, Vue uses yes, five, six, or seven JavaScript or TypeScript, depending on how you configure your Vue application. It's a, a lighter framework. Uh, it supports its own libraries, like its own routing state management libraries, whereas as opposed to React, you'd use maybe like third-party libraries to handle um, state management, Redux, or React Router for um, some of the routing. Benchmark speeds are, you know, pretty close to React. Uh, it's fast and relatively small in file size. So why do you use a framework? Um, the essential, I guess, fundamental reason anyone would use a JavaScript framework is keeping the UI in sync with the state of your application data is it's hard. So every time you change the state data in your app or a component, you need to update the UI and reflect that. And trying to write the sync code yourself in vanilla JavaScript, you know, would result in 50, 100 times more brittle, fragile code than just using the binding code that these framework um, framework libraries already, already provide. So, you know, build off their gains and don't necessarily reinvent the wheel if choosing to use a framework or go in room. From the perspective of the San Verde community, why use a JavaScript UI framework? I, first and foremost, I guess frameworks allow developers to develop front-end applications much, much faster than doing it in vanilla JavaScript. You have the data binding, UI syncing, event handling, frameworks give you like established um, tested patterns to run with right out of the gate. Another reason, if you're working with you know, larger distributed teams and developers, I think there's a benefit to using well-known or a well-known, well-established framework with good documentation. And it just makes time to learn shorter for developers. And this definitely you know, saves time and money. And it can also make finding people who work on your applications a lot easier. Saver developers could also benefit from uh, established community patterns in a framework that are not necessarily tied to a specific individual application. So say we pulled Hyrax, or say we pulled React into Hyrax, we could use like React's way of handling state management or you know or routing or whatnot instead of like an individual applications you need custom pattern so this is again just relying upon familiar and more established ways of doing things for developers <coughs> one of the most immediate gains you know i could see sender applications hyrax in particular i'm kind of thinking of benefiting from in the future would be component libraries But I guess before we jump into component or kind of describing component libraries, I guess I'd like to share our experience in Northwestern in building out a React JS discovery application uh, without a component library, and then maybe the need for uh, one might be a little bit more clear. So about a year ago, um, we started the process of building out single page standalone front-end discovery app as I guess a fresh way to explore Northwestern's collections material. So it kind of served two purposes. Number one, to build out customizable UI that would be relevant hopefully for years to come. But also, you know, maybe an experiment for us of how to 
restructure more Western's repository like application ecosystem to be more API driven. And the end result, it's almost finished, is that uh, we decided on ReactJS, the framework of choice, at the time due to its dominant market share, its great documentation, speed performance, flexibility, relatively small footprint size in our applications, and uh, its development tooling is pretty advanced and awesome to work with at the moment. So when jumping into creating our React application, step one uh, was to start with mockups. And our development strategy was to create high-res mockups, which are basically HTML templates with full markups. So these were used to quickly create a look and feel for the application and to work with uh, end users or cur curators to identify what, where, why, and how we wanted to uh, display collection items. And why, I guess at this point, ask why do this in React and why not just do the, build this out on Rails? You know, like what user interactions can we improve on using JavaScript components. Fast global search. Um, we wanted you know, a, a global search present in the header for the entire application, kind of tying everything together. We envisioned this search remembering maybe previous searches, uh, maybe current search state, maybe use type ahead, possibly dynamically rendering you know, thumbnail lists, or previews. Who knows? You know, we wanted the flexibility to kind of create it um, as we, were, as we were going. And we wanted to maintain smooth user experience in the search process, displaying results without the need for page refresh. We also wanted image carousels that would most likely be dynamic. We didn't know quite how uh, the end user or curators would want items or collection groups displayed, you know, maybe by recently digitized items, recently digitized collections, or maybe grouped by subject or library unit or keyword or who, who knows. And the content of these carousels could also change on the fly depending maybe on like filtering or user searches. So again, we wanted to provide a smooth um, in-page experience for carousels. We also wanted to give uh, or provide fasting and filtering of search results in real time. So in this example on the left, User creates state or click state created or a subject or a work type, we wanted those results to render you know, almost immediately in the right, right hand column and not wait two or three seconds for the page to reflect, refresh. Fast discovery, we wanted to allow users also to quickly, I guess, kind of maybe drill down from a generic collection, say, to a specific item detail page in a seamless, near immediate user experience. So I'm probably repeating myself in some terms like no page refresh, did UX, but I guess to sum up when thinking about this, we want to give users in this application kind of the same experience that they get, uh, whether they're you know shopping on Amazon or browsing Netflix or you know researching places to stay on Airbnb or whatnot. We want to keep that you know, that same level of UX. So the next step is to convert the HTML high-res mockups we created to React components. Um, mock layouts in hand, which were constructed from Northwestern's global marketing department. Um, the next step is just to jump in and start creating components. And a good first step to recommend, um, regardless of or library frame you can choose is just to identify uh, what what your components are in your UI. So a good strategy you kind of see across the board is just take your UI and just draw boxes around everything. Kind of feel out where the natural groupings are, um, what components are related, and how which components are totally isolated. Um, just kind of like see how things kind of fit together when they're broken down. And when you start this this process, you know, typically you're going to want to start out large and then again just kind of like break down. So, for example, here you could have home page container component. And maybe its only job is to reach out to an API 
and it grabs a bunch of data and it feeds that data to a top navigation component and it feeds data to primary <coughs> navigation and it feeds data to uh, the car you know, carousel number one or whatever. So kind of, again, the process, start out with a big homepage component and then just kind of create components where they naturally occur in your UI. Boxes. And then when, when going through this, so a strategy that, that we took was, you know, going generic components first. Um, what UI elements were we going to reuse in the application? So let's create that presentation markup, you know, again, just once, and then determine data requirements for each component. So again, we're combining presentation HTML markup with application logic. So here, if you take this thing called MU button, um, for this component, you know, we pass in two pieces of data, label text, which the button is going to display, and say a route for where to go when the button component is clicked. And again, for any button, define one time, used everywhere. And the same thing for collection and carousel items. We're going to kind of sprinkle this throughout our application. Uh, in reality, there might be a few more routes passed in, but again, you're getting an array of objects, uh, maybe a title for a carousel and then define once, used everywhere in the application. I think this generic components um, pattern is definitely something also that Sendera applications could, could benefit from. Um, so when creating these generic components, you're not just minimizing you know, code duplication, but you're also keeping implementation mistakes uh, to a minimum. When you define a component just one time, uh, basically making design decisions just once. So say I'm working on Hyrax and I'm going to pull in a new form group button. If uh, Hyrax had some pre-wired Hyrax components available to developers, um, all I would do is just pull in the component and put it in my application someplace. I don't have to think about you know, what the button size is going to be, whether I'm adding the proper accessibility attributes, if I'm including all the extra markup that you know maybe is necessary to display a screen reader um, output or a public facing label or configuring a you know an add or delete icon in the button, all that is kind of handled in one place in the component. Another big uh, win and I guess time saver for us in choosing to use. Uh, uh, a UI framework can go the route of components is um, using community React libraries to help kind of round out our UI. And again, same concept as it is in the back end, we're using Ruby gems, server side, um, but with NPM and NPM registry, you know, there's countless time saving components uh, that you can just plug directly into your component based application. And for us, in particular, a huge win. Um, has been reactive search. So since currently our, our repository contents are now stored in like a, an Elasticsearch AWS indexer, and reactive search library by pulling that in gives us components which handle search querying, facet filtering, and more. And these reactive search components are customizable. So we can pull them in, in into our code um, and kind of tweak them out so they look, act, and feel like Northwestern branded components. And again, when we're kind of using these within our application, we port a reactive search component, you know, right next to any button or one of the carousels. We pull it in the exact same way, and um, React just stitches it all together for us. And just even going the route of, say, reactive search, this probably saved our team 50, you know, to 100 hours in development time in trying to not only create all the UI interactions for that, but say Elasticsearch changes the way that it, um, you know, its data model and its indexing when it spits out. You know, you go <coughs> with a third party um, component library like this, and hopefully someone in that library is making those updates, and it's one less thing for our development team to worry about in the future. Uh, this looks a little tight, but I think the, the gist of this slide initially was going to be was that, so say for now we chose uh, React as our um, choice 
of a UI framework, um, and then say in here, say the same area community starts rallying around Vue, for example. Um, we don't have to change really that much in the overall architecture of our system. Um, hopefully, the API the indexing is all going to look the same. Um, we take the time to, you know, just kind of transition uh, Vue, Angular, Ember, whatever. It's just an isolated piece, which is another benefit of going this more modular route. So back to component library stuff. Um, so what if all these UI pieces that uh, we're building out, um, say we already had React or Vue or Angular components created. So say there was, there was like a Northwestern search input uh, or text box or a purple Northwestern button component or photo grid. It would save us in building out this application a ton of time in like kind of seeing minimize maybe like style decision making so I don't have to make it maybe a, a professional designer, a UX uh, person, um, you know, kind of gives the responsibility back to them. And as we began creating our own applications components, um, at the same time we kind of also initiated a Northwestern global uh, React component library. So we would take some of these initial generic components and drop them into just a Northwestern um, global marketing repo that um, hopefully any other developers in the Northwestern community, if they're going to build out a React application, they can just reach into this repository and just pull out all these common elements, um, common components, I guess, that we already kind of created. So it saves them a little bit of time. They can just jump in straight into building applications and actually do stuff instead of you know, recreating all these smaller pieces. So kind of by definition, a component library, what, what is it? Um, I guess one definition is a cloud-based folder that consists of all the design-style parts of a website or a piece of software. It uh, helps designers work in a consistent way and becomes very time efficient when executed correctly. Uh, it follows atomic design methodology and just treats you know, UI components basically as the composable building blocks your UI application. And again, from Sam Barry's perspective, why use a component library? Um, reusable components you know, help developers move faster by creating these higher level abstractions. They eliminate decision fatigue, um, enforce a standardized approach, and for Sam Barry developers, you know, they don't have to ask, should I put the label above the input or beside it? Should I display validation errors on the right or below the input? What color should the air be? You know, how should I mark required fields and all this stuff? Reusable components enforce user interface consistency. So in the San Vera community, we have many developers. Well, we want to build applications that look like they were built by one developer. And to do that, it's almost critical to, to use reusable components. Um, copy and paste is not the best design pattern. And if developers, you know, designers have the freedom to start from scratch again and again, then when you find these applications start looking like patchwork of different looks, feels, and technologies. In a client-side rendered application, uh, every time you use a component, you improve performance because it minimizes the application's bundle size and uh, memory footprint. So when you use a component a second time, um, it requires no additional download and hardly any extra memory. More code eventually leads to more maintenance, and more maintenance leads to higher costs and more people which creates additional communication overhead that can slow down uh, community development even further. And reusable components can uh, minimize the amount of front-end code that Samira applications would need to create and maintain today and into the future. So easier updates later. Um, so sadly, it's kind of true that say we chose uh, you know, a new fancy React or Ember component. Um, one of these days, that's it's going to be legacy. But by creating a reusable component library today, we kind of minimize the eventual surface area that needs updating later. So it's far easier to migrate 
a uh, componentized application so we can replace existing components when that day comes, uh, one component at a time. And it's not really so easy when your application is a patchwork of different technologies and patterns on the front end. Again, reusable components minimize the surface area. Sandberg applications would need to update later. And a component library, you know, doesn't actually require that much work. Um, for instance, if we chose, or if some bare applications chose React or Vue, you don't necessarily need to start from scratch. There's already, um, uh, for example, a React Bootstrap component library with pretty strong community support that we just pull into our front end application and start replacing standard HTML markup with components. And at the end of the day, it's going to look exactly the same, if not improved by being more consistent. Again, you know, depending on whatever query you choose, there's a strong now and ever-growing community of these component libraries that um, are just, yeah, it's, you know, the growth numbers just keep increasing from 2017, 2018, and in the future. Do I understand? So, I guess some final thoughts, um, and even after I guess we spent a couple days here at Center Connect and just kind of <coughs> listening to how a lot of other people are kind of handling front end decision making. I think now is a really good time for the Sandberg community, Hyrax, or you know, other applications to start, you know, to consider s s starting to adopt some JavaScript UI um, component patterns, um, maybe decide on a, a library or a framework that. Um, maybe multiple institutions or organizations that are interested in pursuing. Um, just kind of stay on par with what's going on in most of the applications that everyone uses on a daily basis. You know, all of these applications you use on your phone or browsing the web, they're all using these um, JavaScript frameworks. And, you know, why is that not really the case in Sender applications? Um, Another reason I think now is a good time to think about it. I think the UI component architecture patterns, they're evolving in, in, I think, all the right ways. It's kind of a running joke that, you know, what's the JavaScript framework flavor of the week, right? It changes from month to month. And there is some truth to that, but I think in the JavaScript world, they're also just trying to keep up with how humans are interacting with UI devices. I mean, uh, next. Next year, so we're going to be not just interacting with UI um, applications on our phone or on the computer. I mean, it's going to be the touch screen when we get a train back to the airport or at restaurants. I mean, these UI applications are just kind of surrounding us, and um, leveraging these frameworks kind of makes uh, keeping up with how users are using applications a little bit easier. And finally, I think it's this might be. Just personal opinion. Sorry. So uh, I think it's kind of crucial for Sendberry's you know, stature and hopefully future adoption to present you know some of its flagship applications as cutting edge modern user experiences. Again, that you know people are becoming used to nowadays and just kind of keep a level of professionalism um, and just provide a really good, effective user experience. Make users want to use the applications we're creating. And I think that's about it. Um, if anyone's curious on looking at some of the stuff <coughs> at our Northwestern React application, it's all open source, it's all available on our um, Dora Northwestern GitHub account, and I can post some links in the UX chat if anyone's curious in the future. Kind of ran a little bit on our time. Do you want to, does anyone have any quick questions? Yeah. Um, this is great. Thank you for going through all this. Uh, what do you found to be the most useful way to organize your CSS with these components? Because I, I, uh, I looked a little bit react to a little bit of view, and I, I forgot which one offers this, but I know there was an ability to say, here's my component, I'm actually packaging my CSS in the same JavaScript files. It's nice because it's isolated, but I know that goes against sort of the more traditional, like, your sure. resolutions or everything. I was curious about how, what would you do? Sure. So, this question was, how do you use CSS, or what are, 
what's a good pattern for using CSS in JavaScript component architecture? And there's um, a few ways to approach that. Um, one thought is that you keep all your, you don't have like CSS files that you're pulling into your application anymore. If you're going to use styles in a component, you just define those styles directly in the component and they're only used there. Um, that's one line of thinking. Another line of thinking is, uh, so for us, for the Northwestern application, it was, I started doing that and that was a ton of work. So it was just a lot easier to pull in some compressed, minified Northwestern um, styles and just reference one giant, you know, or I guess one complete CSS kind of file and then just use standard typical class names. Um, so I guess jury's still kind of out on that, but I see the trend being to increasingly like keep your keep your styles um, bundled with your components. I think that's the way it's going to go in the future. Okay. Um, yeah. How are you handling ADA with the CAG uh, testing with this? Uh, testing? Or just making sure that you're, uh, you have ADA in this Northwestern? Because like earlier there was the Penn State said so at BWCAG 2.0. Do you have anything like that? I mean, in terms of like accessibility yeah. compliance and stuff? Okay. So this question was how are we handling accessibility compliance? Um, so to kind of indirectly answer that question, I think if you approach designing a UI applications like this um, in a more componentized way, you can, when you define the component, you can kind of you know, put all the accessibility attributes in that one component definition file. So, um, I guess, you know, you'd want to ensure that you're compliant when you're defining the component, and then, again, if you use that button 30 different places in your application, you're guaranteed that, you know, you'll be compliant with that instead of currently, now, say you just copy and paste the button and you forget it. Area. You know, it's easy to do. So I think by going the component route in general, um, as long as you're diligent and in addressing accessibility there, then that's probably the best approach. We probably could be doing it better, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Or, I'm sorry. I haven't tried this yet, but I know that DQ has a tool called Backscore that can be used for automated accessibility testing. Okay. And I can post that link. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, it's for automated web UI testing. Okay. Accessibility. I think it basically does the same thing that um, a tool like the Wave tool would do, um, but it, it's like an automated test. Okay. Like, I think it's similar to your testing. Yeah, so, yeah, if anyone has suggestions or... a little bit, like every time you make a change in the interface, I would try to get them. I just haven't had the time to, to do it yet, but I can post the link. That'd be, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. And then maybe Drew, and then I'll turn it over to, to Nick over here. Yeah. Uh, so, a big uh, roadblock for any type of adoption of a new technology in San Mara is the fact that you have to convince like, at least 100 people that it's a good idea and that it's worth the benefit. So, in addition to the things that you said, um, like tossing on an advantage of, of, say, like, this is way easier than the current method of overriding. Blacklight UI. <laughs> like if any if that case can be made, then that would be a great case to make for the same very community. Um, and also a, a big selling point would be, and I don't know if this is true or not, but if it can be implemented slowly, piecemeal over time, yeah. then that would be worth noting. <laughs> and, and how yeah. to do it. And um, and the only other thing I can see like as far as being pushed not the only thing, but <laughs> one of the pushbacks might be learning curve. You know, for new adopters. Sure. And, yeah, like kind of abandoning uh, the Rails thing that everybody knows. And sure. And again, it doesn't have to be like abandoning the Rails way that everyone knows. It's just learning something a little bit new. So, to your point about maybe how do you start this shift? Like maybe slowly. So, one thing we're doing in Avalon 7 development is kind of so with um, Webpacker now, you know, you can just kind of bring in components, like it doesn't have to define the entire view. So you could add your standard Rails view and say we just want 
um, one or two UI elements at a time in your React components and live alongside everything else the way it's been done. So that might be like a slow, incremental way. And we're doing that in Hyrax, so. But I think you're right, like, you don't want to just completely burn it down and learn this now. Oh, yeah, slow and steady and make it a learning opportunity. That's I have a question that's kind of related to his. When, you know, your first bullet says, yeah, it's an excellent time to consider adopting it. I'm, I'm new to Centera, I'm working with the team who's building out Hyrax and some presentation. So what, in the end when you say it's a great time for the community to consider it, if the community both considered it and said yes, what does that look like to you? Like, what, I, what does that mean? Um, how does it change what, what exists or what comes back to Hyrax? Like, what, what does that mean? I think it would, you know, that would definitely start some really good conversations that would just start analyzing the current, for Hyrax, for example, you just analyze the current state of the application and say, how is this thing constructed? You know, is it, are there API endpoints that would even support, you know, on the back end side of things, are there right endpoints in place to be able to start establishing incremental small patterns? Um, so yeah, I, I don't know, it's probably got broad implications that you just get yeah. But I think it's good to talk about. I mean, it's, I've heard it in some other presentations. Like this, you know, this isn't, I don't think, just like a fad or a trend. This is going to happen. It's happening. It's already happened in practice. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm not There's, questioning that. I'm just yeah. like pragmatically speaking. <coughs> totally. Since yeah. I don't understand the center of community yeah. entirely yet, I'm trying to figure out, like, oh, pragmatically yeah. speaking, what does that mean? If I'm somebody who's going to hire developers to work on the future, yeah. who am I looking for? How does this decision change that? What are you imagining being changed or not yeah. being changed? Um, I don't how know. much is it just a general, oh, we kind of suggest X, Y, and Z, maybe use Q, you know, and so on. Yeah. So well, just to speak to that real quick, um, a lot of that, <coughs> the way that it typically happens is somebody starts a working group. And there's a protocol for starting these working groups. And they're pretty well formed at this point as far as like what to expect. Um, and usually it's a, it's a combination of experts or people with some kind of expertise. Uh, and then anyone else who really wants to join has the time, really. And they're usually uh, anywhere between six months and a year um, kind of a plan, you know, and they come up with some deliverables, and then they go through those deliverables for weekly meetings and stuff like that. So that's how efforts like this tend to get done in this group. Okay. If you're interested in starting a working group on it, you will probably buy it if you're I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, it sounds interesting and reasonable. I'm just, yeah, I guess pragmatic, I was wondering in his view, is it like, oh, well, we would definitely go with React, or we would definitely go with you, Anyway. Yeah, yeah, I think just the point is just to start the conversation. Right now, it seems like it's just like the conversation's happening not a lot, and maybe like just in corners, but, you know, and does it matter what you choose, React or Vue? Or, no, it doesn't matter, but it would be nice if like, say, and we just, were kind of talking about this before, like say five institutions are like, hey, we want to do it with Vue, great, you know. And then you just kind of build off of what everyone else is doing, share the learning and stuff. So. But it's, it's a good question. <laughs> so, thanks, Adam. Um, I'm going to approach this a little bit more like a uh, lightning talk, I guess. We're running short on time in the session. So, um, I'm Nick Dragovic from Emory University, and I'm here to talk to you about the uh, distributed usability research team. Um, the session description says that um, this is intended to convey the results of our round two. However, um, we actually realized that you know, it might actually make sense for us to attend, uh, connect, hear people's ideas, um, kind of get some input, and then kind of launch that initiative um, afterward. So um, basically what I'm just going to do is kind of describe the background, um, what we've done in the past, and then uh, kind of sketch out some of the ideas we have for our uh, current iteration, um, and then get feedback. So please feel free to ask questions uh, along the way, um, and I'm going to kind of go over that really quickly. So, um, in the beginning, uh, one of our colleagues from the University of Michigan, uh, Ben Howell, um, kind of initiated this project where uh, we were kind of talking about um, scaling up UX work um, into the community. Uh, because we see that um, in the UX interest group, um, there are a lot of people doing a lot of customization locally, and it seems like there is a lot of great UX work happening at different institutions. Uh, but we want to provide a forum uh, and a way for that to kind of scale up to the community. Um, instead of you know working in silos, maybe um, you know kind of like sharing uh, components um, is a good thing to do, and then also um, 
the way that we evaluate kind of our interfaces and maybe we can um, kind of collaborate and share, um, just make the um, kind of out of the box functionality um, maybe more appropriate um, by default for a wider variety of adopters. So um, our first round uh, was on Sophia and uh, we evaluated the um, deposit process. Uh, which is really interesting, but um, we faced a number of challenges kind of even getting the initiative going. Um, one of the first things was kind of a test environment. So uh, Michigan was really helpful. Um, they kind of installed a default Sophia application for us to use um, with our users. Uh, so that was great, because otherwise we wouldn't have even really been able to do it at all. Um, but now, um, I guess that, uh, we're about like a year later, and uh, luckily we have new racks, which is hosted by digital curation experts. Um, so we have a test environment now uh, where we can uh, kind of work with high racks, and uh, we see now that um, in the past year there's been a lot of really exciting new functionality coming out. Um, one of our prior UX interest group members proposed that we might want to um, evaluate the way that collection extensions work. Um, I think that's a really interesting idea because, um, you know, Staff users kind of um, get a good UI um, UX experience as well, and um, you know, as I've uh, kind of come to learn from uh, Saint Vera Virtual Connect and a workshop earlier this week, um, that functionality is really kind of complex. So uh, we think it'd be interesting if we could kind of put that in front of library staff users uh, and kind of get a better idea of kind of how people uh, interpret um, that system functionality. Um, it also has the um, additional um, kind of incentive of uh, targeting uh, library staff users, which are kind of an easier captive audience because uh, in the past, at least in my experience, it's been a little bit difficult to recruit users for um, unpaid UX studies. So um, basically what we're going to try to do is um, set up a very like, kind of minimal, quick um, usability test around um, creating admin sets, configuring the types, um, and just basically seeing how easy it is for people who work with digital collections kind of on a regular basis to um, you know, create custom collections, um, apply whatever visibility and permission settings they need to, and then also add <coughs> them to those collections. Um, obviously, it's uh, been kind of a long time coming um, for us to kind of have this more flexible uh, kind of architecture for managing collections um, in Hyrex. So um, yeah, uh, that's basically what we want to do. Um, and we also have the good fortune of having really great documentation on that code. So um, some of the QA um, testing kind of procedures um, are kind of available uh, for us to use as a springboard um, and kind of put in front of uh, real users. So uh, that's pretty much it. I um, kind of just wanted to offer that as a proposal and then uh, kind of ask if folks have additional questions about what our intentions are behind this project uh, or offer any kind of input uh, because you know, I'm not even a kind of regular user of Pyrax. We have one live application um, at Emory, but um, that one is uh, hosted by uh, data creation experts uh, themselves, so um, we're um, pretty green as far as day-to-day um, -day work um, in Hyrax, but there's always new racks out there to kind of help us uh, get our hands dirty with that stuff. So with that, um, I'll just ask if anyone has questions. Huh? All right, well, so we'd love to say at Emory, I'm going to take a look back. Thanks. <laughs>